to you for coming. You know, when I called to order the chairs, they asked me, how many? I was like, I don't know, I, 500. <laughs> I don't know, we've all been to poetry meetings where there have only been two, and so something between 500 and two. <laughs> but I'm sorry I didn't order enough, and I'm so moved by this wonderful crowd as like a party of all my favorite people. So I really appreciate your being here. Um, so this, uh, my chapbook, I Left My Wings on a Chair, came out with Kent State Press, and um, I dedicated it to friendship. And so um, in honor of, of you, I dedicate this reading um, to you. And also uh, special appreciation to my mom for being here and my daughter and my Tony. So I would like to start out with a few poems for them. Mythology. You brought me into this world, my child, with your skin and need. I sang to you in the deep canyons of canned goods and dairy. I told you the words of our prophets, Shel Silverstein and Maurice Sendak. Your favorite legend was My Friend the Cow, where animals walked in ancient fields of grass and flowers of many colors. Rounded red pickups brought bottles of white milk to the city. Away in the country, the sun shines bright, it began. Sometimes I dropped in the moon to trick you, but you knew. And we have four papers in there. <laughs> um, this is after uh, um, my mom and I have been so fortunate to have taken some really wonderful trips with, with her. And we went to, um, to uh, the Netherlands a few years ago. And our friend Tan Vinken there said, it's a nice country, but it needs a roof. <laughs> so this is Ode to the Canal Duck. On cobblestone we pick up our feet, check back and forth for cars, electric trams, and bicycles. Trams issue one courteous clang before rubbing into crowds thick with tourists. Be careful, says our Irish guide Ryan O'Malley, or O'Brien. You wouldn't believe how many people are killed in Amsterdam by trams. In America, we're cautioned on moving sidewalks. We'd never be set free in a sea of trams. O'Malley says the Dutch are practical. You can squat in an empty building. Your prostitutes are unionized. Your pot is taxed. Your buildings packed with insulation. Your health care free. O'Malley's theory is that in a country that's below sea level, everyone works together. I see what he means. Old buildings under renovation. Old church in the red light district. Who needs salvation? Carbon dioxide from chickens fed to greenhouse tomatoes. Phlegm in the throat fed to language. Rain comes down from above, tulips. Up from below, canals. Oh, Mother Coot, your nest shot through with primary colored trash, cups, tape, wrappers, straws, balloons, three babies squirming around your legs. Mornings, we pass a sculpture of Gandhi in his minimalist clothes. Evenings, we eat white asparagus grown under the blind ground, exactly now in season. Nick, I'm going to look to you for a sound check, so if my voice drops, <laughs> let me know. Okay, and... Enough about your flat tire in the middle of Pennsylvania, and who left jagged metal there? I'm saving up news, going out to pull rows of Sharon saplings in rain. 
you put a stop to that. Everyone is crazy here with politics. I am too, but I'm sick of the name calling. Come back on your new tire. Your windshield rinse clean in the Delaware water gap. Tell me how it was there and not home. Come back wearing your magenta shirt, your penumbra. I miss our Cambrian dreams. Okay, I'm gonna lose these and then I'm gonna read them. So um, all of you, because you're artists and um, and poetry lovers and Unitarians and <laughs> everything, I know that you as well as I um, just spent your childhood asking what if. So this is kind of a book of what if. Um, it is a book of poetry, but these are all prose poems, so they just look like a block of text, like a paragraph, and they're really stories. So there, um, a lot of them are stories about what if. So, for example, one day um, I was looking at Etsy, and I saw a picture of a wire man, and I started wondering what the wire man's life was like, and what if he fell in love? And in my poem, he does fall in love, and he calls her Etsy. <laughs> the wire man springs off the metal pot filled with Spanish moss. Not that he needs to sit with those trellis legs upright, the effort it takes to bend something like a knee. But he's been with the boiled wool woman, admiring her seams and the way her waist makes a crook. She can't stand on her own, but she leans with grace on the glass emerald bonsai, lit with sunlight that goes right through him. She absorbs the light, has a fullness the wire man can't stop thinking about. If she says yes, he thinks, they will make love under the emerald tree, his sharp edges curved in, her rippable skin warm under the heart pocket dress. Later, he will make her a mouth. So this poem is, um, I wrote this after I heard an adult ask a child of five or six, what, what do you want to be when you grow up? And then I started thinking, what if we were, our world was limited to only the careers that we knew about when we were five or six? <laughs> And then I wondered, what if there was like a camp that you could go to and you could try out that thing that you wanted to do? So this is career wish camp. <laughs> the firefighters and pyromaniacs are evenly matched. <laughs> Early afternoon, we're surrounded by sirens and burning houses. All morning, the carpenters hammer up the firewood structures, and the crazy pyros run past trailing gasoline. <laughs> Police catch them, read them their rights, let them go. <laughs> In the performing arts center, stocky ballerinas dance Bumblebee remix to a recorded audience. When they fall on their clavicles, they go to the hospital where everyone's a doctor or a nurse. <laughs> the astronauts know how the ballerinas feel. They get dizzy, too. <laughs> Down the hall from the veterinarians, aquariums bubble with frog eggs. I am a biologist. My nails pond green. We touch everything. Newborn moles we call jelly beans. The dry squeeze of snakes under lip of turtle shells and their feet pumping air when we don't put them down. We climb a ladder to measure giraffes. There are enough microscopes for everyone. We watch movies of dividing E. coli, whale migrations, time-released plants jerking into adulthood, human fetuses glowing red in round bellies. We know about sex. We don't tell jokes about it. We're not the comedians. The stylists do our hair twice a week. For dinner, we eat pizza with heaps of pepperoni and wedding cake, our lips pink and blue from icing roses. We applaud the pizzeria cooks and bakers and big hats. No one makes salad. <laughs> Movie stars smoking cigarillas come out, followed by circus performers. The biologists don't want the tigers doing tricks. 
We sure wish we could spin on ropes, I thought. The president say, my fellow Americans, pilots give soldiers a ride to war. Each day, a few don't come back. Um, and this is the dangers of miso soup. <laughs> so um, the backstory to this is that um, one day, one night I was at a Japanese restaurant with a bunch of people and there was a young woman there who seemed very nervous and self-conscious and she kept making these declarative statements about herself and one of them was I I don't trust miso soup, and then my <laughs> mind started following that like a, rat, like a hound after a rabbit. Um, and the, so this book was published by the Kent State Press, and every year they pick a couple of poems and hand them off to graphic art students at Kent State, and they make, they make a design, they illustrate it, and that's what the posters and postcards here are. Um, from, from that effort and also they it's called traveling stanzas and they put them on buses so this poem is going around in, in Cuyahoga and um, Summit counties <laughs> I don't trust miso soup she says and ominous music begins to play in the background <laughs> as she pushes her soup away with long, rust-colored nails, miso soup sloshing innocently in its painted bowl, although suspiciously murky, hiding <laughs> strips of seaweed. Even later, when she tells me what she meant was, I am vegetarian. <laughs> Sometimes Japanese restaurants stir fish paste into their miso soup. I can't stop the movie from playing. <laughs> Courageous heroine who leaps from her car, escape facilitated by her unclasped seatbelt. And then, no time to scream, miso soup in close pursuit. She runs down the street in smoke stilettos, flowy sleeves billowing like smoke from a gun. Miso soup closing in. White paddle spoon clattering. <laughs> thinking, what if? <laughs> so this is still life with ants. The skylight leaked since the windstorm. Ants dropped one by one onto the dining room table, smashed bang bang with fists. He piled his corpses beneath a beer cap. Before arriving, he and his girlfriend had argued about her friends. She'd thrown water, he'd overreacted. It wasn't like the days when they broke walnuts with hammers. Now his pocket was damp. She was complaining, their friends nodding. An ant crashed onto his steak. He pictured the ant dragging the meat up the wall <laughs> through the skylight. She was still talking when an ant fell on, into his beer glass. He imagined an empty chair where she was sitting. The ants kept swimming. Later he told her he'd expected her to cry. 
He dreamed ants fall through the skylight all night, colonizing the grand piano, streaming between the strings with beer caps, cheese, money, walnuts, and hammers. <laughs> So um, I was listening to some, um, some political conversation some years ago, the last election cycle before now. They're all kind of the same, aren't they? And so somebody was saying, well, we can't possibly make any changes because of jobs. And I started thinking, well, there must have been jobs that we've lost in our history because we changed our mind about something. And so then I wondered, what if there was a camp you could go to to try out these obsolete jobs? So this is obsolete career camp. <laughs> <laughs> so I picked Sampler Week. Of course, the first day I went out on the whaling ship, I couldn't believe how bad it smelled. The fake whale was real enough. I thought it would make some noise when we heaped it up and maybe it did, but we didn't hear it in the air. I decided to stick with the Historic Hunter series and shot at a few fake buffalo from a train. We tracked Tasmanian wolves and even woolly mammoths. On chemistry day, we made DDT and gassed aquariums full of mosquitoes. We learned how so many chemists lost their jobs. The ones who made thalidomide, medicinal arsenic, mustard gas, Agent Orange, and a lot of others. It was kind of sad. You hate to see people out of work. <laughs> we got uniforms for transportation day and rode around yelling, Mark Twain and Pony Express. I fell off my chariot. I rode to medicine camp in a carriage. The driver, my friend Derek, snapped the horses and they ran fast. The blood letter was off. I saw some campers operating iron lungs, their fake patients' pale heads poking out the ends. On Civil War times day, we didn't bother with blacksmiths and coopers. We saw those at the fair, although cutting soldiers' legs off with saws was nothing we'd seen up close. <laughs> at the end of the week, the camp counselors asked us who we thought might be an obsolete career camp of the future. Coal miners, someone said. I could see myself going down into the pit, getting cold and shining that skinny light off my helmet. Maybe nuclear weapon builders, someone else said. They're the people who make high fructose corn syrup. <laughs> we nodded. We'd heard about that stuff. Or spam, said Derek. You're crazy, said Justin. I love spam. <laughs> So, um, this poem is about places that begin to absorb the meaning of an event that happened there, and sometimes that event even supersedes the, the, what the real place is about, like Kent State, it's, right? It stands in for this place. And so, I began to imagine what if there was a museum and every room had one of these event places in it. Um, and these are just the ones that I know, but you could write a whole poem about the ones you know too, right? Like Newtown would maybe be one of them. So, at the event museum. You may be surprised to know that these are real places, our tour guide says. You can find them on the map, at the end of the tour. She hands us our radiation suits. Half of us go into Chernobyl, the other half into Hiroshima. We walk from the before room to the after room. Our Geiger counter clicks and wheedles. My mask is hard to see through and it takes me a while to realize there are no more people. The ambulances have left. I want to warn the dogs. It feels so real. The guide has never heard of Three Mile <coughs> Island. We slip off the suits and hear gunshots. What's the difference between Gettysburg and Columbine? Our guide asks. 
We duck out of the way as students run by with their hands up. Their grandfathers were in Vietnam, so they know what to do. The smoke clears and we lay wreaths at white crosses, a single row like Arlington. We're still working on Iraq and Afghanistan, the guide says, and gestures toward the locked doors. We go from Ruby Ridge to Waco. Jonestown is silent. No fire or gunshots. All these people in rows. Motionless fathers hold their children down. We can't see Kool-Aid on their faces. Most of us are crying, and the tour guide promises to cheer us up. We walk bat past Bataan and Auschwitz, all the way to Hollywood. We stay in Hollywood for hours. We better be getting to Ground Zero, Broadway, and Wall Street, calls the tour guide. They are closing Lockerbie and Love Canal, but we just stay in Hollywood watching those beautiful people pose for flashing cameras. Our mother tells us to get a good look. You can be anything you want, she says. Jesus's pastries. Side stand. So I stopped one day. I have a dozen of Jesus heels, I said. They were warm and sugar, and I ate a couple right then. I asked Jesus, how do you come up with that crazy ass name? <laughs> he leaned on his elbows, greasy steam rising up behind him. I was in my balcony, he said taking my brother Rafa's ashes to the Badlands in North Dakota, driving past sunflower fields, the sun going down, all those heads bent like they were praying. Pretty soon the sun's hanging flat over the horizon, leveled right in my eyes. So I drive in real close behind this airstream, and it's all I can see for a hundred miles the back of this airstream with the bumper sticker, Jesus Heals. And I look over at Rafa and I start crying because we were going to open a roadside pastry shop. Everything gets blurry and I wipe my eyes on my sleeve and then I realize that bumper sticker is talking to me. It's saying, hey Seuss, you're going to be okay. You're going to go home and open that stand. And I remember how Rafa used to say, man, I'm the stone in your shoe right under your heel. I laugh and I wipe my eyes again. And the next day I blow Rafa's ashes into Wind Canyon and I come home and open my stand here. I sold so many Jesus heels, I sent Rafa's girls to college. <laughs> After Jesus told me that story, I bought a dozen more, and the falcon too, yellow like the sun.
we're so casual about our language, or maybe that's okay, but I think about it. What does that really mean, and what does that really mean? So this one is about when we say, oh, he died doing what he loved. <laughs> but we really apply that inconsistently. <laughs> so this poem is called Death Wish. <laughs> When his ultralight fell onto the bare tips of pines, hikers saw the flare of yellow jacket billow like a parachute. His body arrived at the airport in cargo, family comforted that he died doing what he loved. Dearly beloved, say this about me. Let me die bent ass naked over the kitchen table. <laughs> Let my last words be Oh, baby. <laughs> Say, she loved that position. <laughs> Let me fall face first into a book. Say, she died on that page. <laughs> or eating chocolate. Let the mortician wipe dark cake from my lips. Roll me into the crematorium. Heart stopped and sticky. <laughs> <laughs> okay, this is called Autobiography, and there are two quotes in this um, poem that begin the poem. So one of them is from my dear professor, Bill Brady, who used to tell us, do you remember this? Don't be married to autobiography, the always with the arm. <laughs> Don't be married to autobiography. And what he meant was, your poem your poem's loyalty was some, is with some kind of an emotional truth. Don't tell me that, well, that's the way it happened. Then write something else. Um, and also, my friend Anja Farron, who said what, to me one time, I may be dating myself here. <laughs> and that got me thinking. <laughs> so this is called Autobiography. I'm not married to autobiography but we are lovers. <laughs> this is my first lesbian relationship. I've been trying to awaken my inner lesbian for years, but until now, all I could muster was an artistic lust for the female figure. <clears throat> but autobiography is different. Although she embarrasses me, won't let me tell the story the way I want to, she reminds me about the wine stain on the satin chair, the forgotten Mother's Day cards, and my fear of glass elevators. She makes fun of me, the gray tooth and the way one eye squeezes shut when I laugh. She says beauty is symmetrical. I'm obsessed with autobiography. I call her late at night and leave message after message. I just want to hear her voice. I think she is two-timing me. I'm afraid she will run off with the other woman. We fight. We make up. We go to our cafe, bookstore. Later I will write about it. When autobiography and I walk by people they know, we know, they tremble. <laughs> so um, one day I was reading the description on, on coffee and so as we all have done that, right? And it seems like the coffee in our freezer is like, like you know, a lover, right? These has these qualities. They're so, they're so human. So this is Ted ruminates over morning coffee. Ted reaches into the freezer for a bag of coffee. Full bodied, the label reads, with an aroma of confidence. If this coffee were a woman, she'd be wearing a red dress. Ted remembers last night, puts the coffee back, squints out the window. In a moment, he reaches in again, expressive, with the hint of the untranslatable, with the perfect coffee for flamenco dancing. <laughs> had called him a stick in the mud. 
How could she say that when they'd only been together a year? He fishes out a bag from behind the white bread. Or with the touch of insouciance, a suburban land. He tries again to remember what Henry looks like. Henry whisking the rain off to Africa, sipping dry martinis under the African sky. Cautious and responsible, do not mix with half and half. <laughs> she will probably be eaten by hippos, or at least mangled, and he, Ted, will visit her every day in the hospital, build a ranch house for her with easy-to-open cupboards. <laughs> Unapologetic, with a virtuous aftertaste. He pours the beans into the grinder, presses the button, and waits. <laughs> to a Halloween party as a grown-up. Um, I loved Halloween when my kids were young, right? We do, we have a blast, right? But um, the grown-up thing, a little shaky ground. Shaky. <laughs> <laughs> Wings. I borrowed a nun costume for their first Halloween party. No one spoke to me. Some party guests began to dip their heads in gin. Others spoke of Central America. Wait, I said, I'm Unitarian. They ate potato chips and pretended not to hear. The Statue of Liberty and corporate chains fell in love with the African bridegroom. The second year, I got a small bag of potato chips and a tube of super glue, and I went as a woman with a chip on her shoulder. <laughs> <laughs> Toward the end of the night, the drunken hostess bit the chip in half. Half a chip is better than no chip, she said, which I think of every time I see that shirt in the closet. <laughs> I went as a grasshopper the third year. It was a joke. One of my friends called me Grasshopper from that TV show, but I ran out of time to make a body, so I wore a green jogging suit and wings. The wings were wide, and I walked from room to room, knocking potato chips <laughs> onto the floor. Cassandra had spent three hours getting her hair curled. When Dimitri asked me to dance, I left my wings on a chair. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank <laughs> you. 